Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Steer Clear Podcast. I'm your host, Don Caps, a part of Belly Up Racing and Belly Up Sports. We're here for episode number four, and today I'm joined by Rob Pretty, first guest outside of the United States. How's it going, Rob? A little bit from Canada. I'm pretty good. <laughs> so, you know, we got... A lot to talk about this week. We're heading into the round of eight. We just concluded the round of 12, so we're going to have to talk about Kansas first. The Hollywood Casino 400. Denny Hamlin took home his fifth win of the season. As a Joe Gibbs racing fan, I want to hear how that race was uh, from your perspective. Uh, Very nerve-wracking and uh, very nail-biting. And I probably said a few bad words. Um, (laughs) it 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 was a good race, though. I mean, honestly, as a Gibbs fan, you got to be excited about what you saw because, I mean, everybody likes to say this now. Kansas is the most similar track to Homestead that we go to in the playoffs, blah, 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 blah. But it's true. And, I mean, you know, I think they were one, two, three maybe at one point because I know Truex was up there for a while. Mm-hmm. And um, that's got to give them confidence. That's, I mean, it has to. I mean, obviously, it's uh, two different racetracks. But, you know, there are similarities, the uh, progressive banking, all that stuff. Um, but the Gibbs guys just – they – They've got great long run speed. And, yeah. Um, it obviously showed this weekend. And I mean, Kyle and Denny, they were like, they were back and forth that last green flag run. I think Denny stretched it out maybe a second on him, but like they were like, they're so close. It was really just, you know, lap traffic and all that stuff. But like they were so even and even Truex, I think me was a little off of them, but those cars are also solid. They're very consistent. You know, no one I'd say in Joe Gibbs has the best car for say uh, a certain week like you know any of them could win any certain week which is you know impressive to say the least but as a fan watching that it was just it was nail biting but it was exciting and uh, I think it was impressive to see Danny Hamlin hold off there especially on the two tires I thought for sure uh, the four tires were going to make a big big difference Um, I think it just shows you what this package does yeah, it's definitely a big call there by Chris Gabehart at the end of that race to call for two tires to have the track position because uh, Hamlin had the lead and he kept the lead with the two tire stop. I believe there were two other cars that went on two tires, didn't really fare off as well. Yeah. And, you know, Chris Gabehart, a huge addition to this 11 team this year, obviously rejuvenating Denny Hamlin's career as we talked about it last week. Denny Hamlin really having a a career year almost. I would you know, say 2010 was really good for him, but this year he really needed this year after the last year. Last year people were starting to write him off. People started thinking he was done. He was going to be booted out of the 11 car, and now he's really solidified his you know stand at the in the 11 car for years to come. Because according to him, he's. When he signed his contract extension, he was going to be much grayer when it was over. So, so I don't think there's any near, you know, end in near sight for Hamlin in the eleven. I think he'll end in his career, his career in the eleven, and that shouldn't be for another four or five years at the least. Yeah, I think he's safe. And honestly, I mean, that just shows uh, you can never trust those uh, goofballs on Reddit. That place could be a little toxic and misleading sometimes. And I mean, FedEx is such a good sponsor for uh, Denny. And uh, they've been with him his whole career. I mean, they're not going to dip him for Christopher Bell. I mean, no offense to those know-it-alls. But like, Denny Hamlin's such a solid race car driver. He's he's well-spoken. Um, obviously, he's got a great relationship with FedEx. I mean, they've been massive supporters of him um you know he owes them a lot but he's also been he's also backed it up i mean what's he got 36 career wins something like that i know he's mm-hmm. been, um you know that's that's a hall of fame career for most guys uh he just needs that championship and i mean you talked about his career you obviously you brought up 2010 i think of 2012 as well you know i always he, he just he slipped right at the end that you know obviously Martinsville wasn't his fault um but those two years that's sort of what it reminds me of this year. He's been so solid. Like, even when he's not winning, I mean, he's got so many top fives. And uh, I, it makes me wonder. I mean, Chris Gabehart, obviously, he's made a big difference. But I have to wonder, like, how? what's the big difference? Is it Denny? Is it this package? Does Denny have more confidence with his package? Or is it what it, is it what Chris Gabehart's doing? Is it a combination of them both? What's the big thing that's made the change for Denny this year? Because last year, he just seemed grumpy. 
he just seemed like he didn't want to be there. Like he just seemed like I don't know, like something was bothering him. And this this year he's come out and just enjoyed himself. I think the five hundred did a lot for him. Yeah, he's very very relaxed at the racetrack. He's just yes. he's got that quiet confidence. He's not going out. He he goes out there and now he's expecting to be up front every race, and they're just taking such a re- relaxed approach to every race. Denny Hamlin, he's been fast almost every week. I mean, he's got ten top fives in his last fourteen races. I mean, yeah. what an incredible stretch when you need to have it too. I mean. Mm. And he's there's been very you know minimal times this year where he's been off. I think he's got the most top fives and I think he got 16 or 17 now. That's the most in his career already. And there's still four more races. And not to say these last four tracks are Denny Hamlin tracks. I mean he is really good at these last four race tracks. I mean this is it's it's hard to pick against Denny Hamlin right now. It's really hard to go against him. The way he's running, the way his attitude is, his attitude is way different. I think he's more mature than his other championship runs. Yes, for sure. He's definitely got a different mindset. And I think one big difference between Gabe Hart and Mike Wheeler is the short tracks. I know it's, you know, only a you know, specified amount of tracks, but you look at Chris Gabe Hart's a short track guy. And he's gotten Denny back up front at the short tracks because Denny, he was, he was still good at Martinsville, but he wasn't like as good as he was. Or Bristol, Bristol, he seemed to lose it, and then he got back up there and won it this year in the, you know, the night race. So I, I think it's all setting up. I think it's hard to pick him this week in Martinsville. We'll get into that later. Uh, you know, just everything going right for Denny Hamlin, I think, for the first time. I think it's the first time he's, you know, cruised through the first two rounds in the playoffs. Usually he's one of those bubble guys. Yeah, he's really just had it easy. And I, I think you talk about that contract, and I think that's got to have been one of the big differences, just the fact that he can relax and enjoy himself, not have to stress out. I mean, think about Eric Jones. I mean, that guy was on the hot seat the whole year. I kind of felt bad for him because you, you can almost see it getting to him. But then he, he put on that big run of, for like four consecutive top fives won the Southern 500. And I mean, you see it with Denny. He's just, he's calm, cool, and he's enjoying himself. And I mean, at this point in his career, that's what he's got to do. And you talked about the next four tracks. I completely agree with you, I think. Obviously, he won Texas in the, in the spring. All of Gibbs was great there. He had some great strategy. Um, Phoenix, he's been, Phoenix is interesting. If he's got good tracks position, he'll be fine. Phoenix is tough because it's so hard to pass in this package. Um, but he's had a solid um, pass there. Martinsville, I mean, what more can you say? Um, he's always going to be a threat there. And obviously, mm-hmm. Homestead loves that track, too. Uh, so it, it is hard not to pick Denny Hamlin. I think if it's going to be the year, it's got to be this one. I mean, I think how special that would be for the whole Gibbs organization, given what happened with J.D. Gibbs and how mm-hmm. much he loved Denny and his whole career. I just think that would be the icing on the cake. And perfect, I mean, I, I try not to show bias, obviously, but I, I think... If there's, if there's one of the stories I want to see this year unfold, I think it's that one. Just, you know, he's the best driver, in, without a doubt, in the field that doesn't have a championship. Mm-hmm. And uh, that would really uh, that would really just solidify his career, for sure. Yeah, if people look at Mark Martin and Carl Edwards as the top guys without a championship, I think you got to throw Denny Hamlin right oh, into absolutely. that conversation. Absolutely. I think, I think I honestly, I might put Denny above both those guys. Like, I love mm-hmm. Mark Martin. Mark Martin's great. He's an unbelievable driver. But, I mean, the, the competition these days, we always talk about it, is so much closer. These guys are so good. They're all so amazing. They all know how to run perfect laps, you know, every single lap. And um, I, I, I mean, you got to put Denny with those guys. He's, you know, a des- I, in my opinion, a deserving champion. Probably should have won it at least once. Yeah, and we're, you know, talking about potential championships. We're going to move on over to four guys that are not going to win the championship this year, those being William Byron, Clint Boyer, Alex Bowman, and Brad Keselowski. I know you want to talk about Brad Keselowski. He got eliminated there and, you know, the whole debacle at the end of the race with the multiple cautions and this and that. Uh, you know, I, I hand this one to you. I You can talk about Brad here. Honestly, Dom, I'm – I'm shocked. Like, I'm speechless. Like, I, I don't think anyone saw that coming. Brad Kozlowski is the guy we've seen in the past. He's known for his epic walk-off wins in the playoffs. I mean, think about Talladega 2014. I mean, he, he made his car as wide as Ryan Newman's head to win that race. But it, he did it, you know. He pulled it off. And you think about the other times he's done it. 
Um, he won Talladega a few years ago. Um, he's one of those guys who comes out of nowhere and can get those playoff wins. And this, he just didn't seem like himself. I think, honestly, I think Penske messed up. I think Paul Wolf, they all just made a mistake trimming out that car, trying to get stage points. They should have just played it smart. I know 18 points isn't a huge bubble, but they should have played it smart like their teammate Lagano put a little more downforce on that car. Because, I mean, you saw him struggling at the end of the race. I'm not... I mean, I, I'm not with Or Kozlowski, but I felt bad for him. You know, I, like it's, it was painful watching him just slip back, and you know he's better than that. So that that's the biggest shock in my mind. He's a guy, and, and he can win at Martinsville. He won Martinsville in the spring. Like, he could easily lock in his round or his, um, his spot in the Final Four if he was still in. And now all of a sudden, he has no chance, and he can play spoiler. And I, I just think it's completely disappointing and almost a little embarrassing for that two team. Uh, just their showing in Kansas was not what you expect from them at all. Yeah, it's interesting with the two car. You know, that whole round he just seemed lost. I mean, he just wasn't he wasn't a factor at Talladega, which you don't see. Mm-hmm. Uh Kansas, he won in the spring and just again, this race was crazy. It was the first race since Las Vegas two thousand seven where the top ten starters, not one of them finished in the top ten. So it really showed on, yeah, yeah, that was an actual stat. It's the third time, I think, you know, it's been a long time. It was the first time since 07 Vegas. And you could just tell, I mean, when you've got David Reagan starting second, Daniel Hemrick on the pole, Bubba Wallace <laughs> in 10, cool. Michael McDowell in sixth. Yeah, you don't expect these drivers to start 10th. You're, you but, know, finish in the top 10. The common trend with all those drivers, they all trimmed out their race cars, and Brad Kuzlowski is one of them, and they all fell back. Yeah, you know, and it's, straight line speed is not everything, and that was a perfect example. And you know, that's the Penske guys over the years, they've been known for their short run speed. Yes. Even, you know, at more, especially at Martinsville this week with Logano. Uh, Logano is always a short run car at Martinsville, but. They always seem to get the pull. I know we were talking about this the other day. They always seem to – Logano will get the pull, and he'll just benefit from it. So he'll get that number one uh, pit stall, that last pit stall, and he'll just gain so many spots on pit road from it. Absolutely. I think we've seen it multiple times now where he's got – he's up front, you know, run goes by and loses a few spots, drops back, and then uh, his pit crew gains him like three or four spots on pit road. He's right back up there. You know, it's just uh... – it's a huge advance, especially at Martinsville. So, I mean, qualifying, everybody should be watching it this weekend because it's uh, it's probably going to be the most meaningful qualifying until we get to Homestead. Yeah, and uh, another driver, I'm, I was kind of surprised with his performance, Alex Bowman. I kind of expected him to be up toward the front a little more than he was. He was kind of – he had to pit there early, and it's just kind of – you know, he got the damage, and I just kind of put him behind the eight ball, and he was never the same after that, and really just ran the mid-20s the rest of the day. It's kind of surprising from a guy who finished second in this race. Oh, I agree, absolutely. I actually had him on my fantasy team this week. Um, I, You know, I had pretty good confidence in him. He just didn't show up. I mean, it was a, su- a surprise. I mean, Hedrick had speed. I mean, Chase Elliott had speed. Uh, Billy Byron had speed. Even Jimmy Johnson, you know, had very, had good speed when he was up there at the end. And, uh, I mean, boom, they, they were just off. I mean, they missed it. I mean, that was probably as big a surprise as Kozlowski was the 88 car. I, I, you know, the other guys, I wasn't as shocked, but definitely Bowman was a guy I thought would be contending. Maybe top five, maybe for the win. Yeah, it's just interesting. You know, you said William Byron. I think that was kind of, you know, him and Boyer, I think, were kind of easy to predict. I didn't think they were going to come through and win. William Byron still doesn't have a win in his career. I think I think next year he'll be able to get it. I think, you know, a year with Chad Canals under your belt, I think that's going to help you next year. And just another year in the Cup Series, being so young, it'll help. Yeah, absolutely. He's so close. He's been, he's been close. He's got speed. He's winning polls. Um, he just needs to put a whole race together. I mean, we talked about that with Eric Jones a few years ago. You know, he showed speed, but he couldn't put a full race, or that team couldn't pull, put a full race together. And you're kind of seeing that with William Byron. Um, at the Roval, I thought he was going to drive away with that thing at the beginning. He had like a four or five second lead. Um, and then, you know, stuff happened. And he just, they can't put a full race together. And it's, you could see it unfolding. And But he's going to win. I, I have confidence in Billy Byron next year. Um, Chad Canout's too good of a crew chief not to make a winner out of him. And I think Byron is a very, very solid driver. Yeah, yeah, no. Next year, I think it's going to be big for William Byron. You know, it's 
it's a lot harder these days to come in as a rookie and kind of dominate. Like, you know, back in 2006 when Denny Hamlin came onto the scene and won two races, he swept the Pocono races and finished third in the points, had a chance at the championship at Homestead. It's just hard to see that nowadays, yeah. especially especially with the 24 car. That's really not the 24 team that left Jeff Gordon. It was it's the five team. Yeah, that was with Casey point. Kane. That kind of that was the worst team at Hendrick. So I think it's kind of kudos to that team for turning it around now to be a playoff, you know, driver. I think because that team was way off a couple of years ago. Even last year it was off. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think they've made some good progress, and um, he, he seems to get a little more confident, and I think Chad Knaus is really going to be good for him. We've obviously seen what Chad Knaus could do in the past. Um, I just I think he's one of the, if not the best crew chief in the sport. Um, I, I just don't see how Byron doesn't get a win next year. I think it would be disappointing if he doesn't get a win next year, because uh, we all know he's fast. We all know he's got speed, and uh, yeah, we'll see what they can make out of that 24 slash 5 car. <laughs> Yeah, and then you got uh, Clint Boyer. He's really just notoriously Boy. struggled at his home track in Kansas. That's the one track he just seems way off. It's it's uh, interesting. He did finish in the top five there in the spring. But other than that, I mean, I guess the spring was kind of misleading because all those guys that were up front were nowhere to be found this race. You know, Eric Jones was up there for a little bit. But Clint Boyer, he was also another one that was just kind of a non-factor all day. Yes, and I mean that spring race came down to a lot of late race restarts and four wide and five wide, and I think Boyer is one of those guys who just snuck his way up there at the end, to be honest, because I don't remember seeing him a ton in that race, so I wasn't surprised by Boyer at all. Honestly, like I think he had more chance of the sun not coming up tomorrow than Clint Boyer winning at Kansas, um, so it was just, you know, it was not surprising at all for me i thought he would be a little better i thought he'd be maybe a top 10 car but he just oh boy he was back there on the spot with like some of the never was it's just like whoa what are you doing you know it's Mm -hmm. really disappointing for them for sure yeah and you you look you know one guy that you know got in by the skin of his teeth uh joey logano i mean talk about i mean the strategy, the luck. I mean, he, this round was atrocious for him. It starts with him in the garage. The round started and he was in the garage. He goes 24 laps down at Dover, finishes 36, I believe. So that's still one point. And then he goes on to Talladega and he's running up toward the front wrecks. And somehow, some way, I don't know how he keeps driving. I, I, I don't know how you replace all that foam. That was kind of, you know, that was kind of interesting. Car. Yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of that. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a guy, you know, start a race in a garage, crash in a plate race, then crash at the end of a mile and a half race all in the same round and make it in advance. Um, you know, it, it really, he's got to be thanking that or sending a Christmas card to Ryan Newman because Ryan Newman really gave him the chance of getting up there in that first stage and stealing those points. And that made the difference. I mean, he was wasn't a contender that day i mean never really got to see how good he was i don't think he was that solid obviously blaney was the class of the field for the penske cars but it was just a guy you thought you really could be knocked out i mean dover i mean yeah like you said getting no points in talladega um you know you, you gotta you gotta have some luck in the sport and to be in the very middle of the wreck at the start of the wreck in the middle of the pack and to escape of that and come away with like an 11th or 10th place finish as just um you know you don't hear about that too often so you got to be good in the sport sometimes you got to be lucky and you know he got some good breaks especially at kansas he thought he had some bad luck with his vibration and ended up being good luck uh with Ryan mm-hmm. in the stage yeah it's joey logano squeaking in it's, you know a polar opposite of his 2015 round the you know, second mm-hmm. round where he swept the round in this round he seemed to Sweep the bottom of the round, you know, I think if they all started at level heads, you know, he would have been easily eliminated. His Absolutely. playoff points definitely saving him. And, you know, another driver, Chase Elliott, slipping in. Uh, he got up there with a four-tire call. I think he restarted sixth after the caution. I believe it was uh, Blaney who blew a tire that kind of closed the field back up with under 15 to go. 
and that's what got them with the two and the four tires. Chase Elliott took four, and he charged up to second, and then he kind of stayed in second. You know, it's him and Kyle Busch battling for second with each restart. So Chase Elliott getting the break, and, you know, I think he was thinking win. He didn't think he could get it on points. When you're 20, 24 points out, I don't think you'd expect to make it on points either, especially with Kozlowski and Logano being the bottom two. I, you can't expect to catch that many points up, you know, but they did. And Chase Elliott squeaks in, and now Chase Elliott could be a driver to get in the final four. He's good at Martinsville. He, I think he's pretty good at Texas. He's good at ISM. I mean, this round sets up nicely for Chase Elliott as well. I think if Chase Elliott can have a really good Martinsville, he's got a shot. Honestly, I think he's going to need to win because, uh, you know, these guys are – he's going to need either to win or everyone else to crash and lose a lot of points just because of the depth that he's in to start with. Um, but like you said, he's very good at Martinsville. He's a guy, I think, who could surprise people this weekend. Obviously, we saw what he did there in the spring, got up there late, um, but really made that little unique second groove line uh, work. And uh, I was I was impressed. I got to be honest with you. I was impressed with what he did at Kansas. That whole team with Alan Gustafson, um, they just they didn't give up and you know took advantage of a good car. They had a good race car. He was good there last year, um, and they were smart. I mean, they took advantage of Brad Keselowski having a, a terrible terrible race, and uh, I think it was an impressive drive to go up there and finish second uh, when you needed to the most. I think it showed. Uh, He's got what it takes. He could. He's definitely. He's gonna be a future champion for one day, in my opinion. You never know. He could sneak it this year. Yeah, he could. And you know, I want to. You know, before we get into Martinsville, I think we should. You know, we got to go over each driver. So I think we'll move with Kyle Larson. I think Kyle Larson's one to watch. I think if he gets to Homestead, he'll be. I think he could be the favorite if Absolutely. he gets to Homestead. And I think that's going to come with the first race. He's got to survive Martinsville. I think that's the one race he needs to get a top 10 if he can. He cannot go out there and, you know, run 20th. He cannot do it. He has to be up front. Now, Martinsville is not notoriously good for him. If he could just survive and stop the bleeding there, I think he's got a decent shot at Texas to win. I think it's a, it's a mile and a half. Kyle Norris is not bad at them. And I, if anything, if he needs to win at ISM, I think he could do it. Over the past few years, he's had cars to win there. Yeah, personally, ISM is a good one. It's going to be tough. Obviously, track position is huge there. And I think that whole team itself hasn't been the best. They've been bad with pit road penalties. So, personally, I see a pit penalty costing him a chance to advance to the Final Four. But with that said, you bring up an interesting point. He's very good at homestead. I gotta wonder what's it gonna be like with this package. We talk about more on throttle time. Kyle Larson is so good there when you're hugging the wall. There's very low grip, the tires are worn, high throttle. This year they're gonna be driving different grooves at Homestead. I really don't think the wall is gonna be the fastest groove, even 20, 30 laps into the run. That's just my opinion. We'll see what happens. But honestly, I think he's gonna need to learn to drive that track. Um, I shouldn't tell him to learn to drive the track. He's amazing there. But you know, drive the different grooves. You know. Um, yeah, but I don't think he can depend on the outside lane uh, like he could the last years. With, the, with that's just the package is so different. The restarts are going to be crazy. You know, he might. I feel like he's going to struggle on restarts if he does make it to Homestead and kind of have a long run car like he's had in the past. But with this package, I don't think the long run car benefits you as much as it you know it used to, uh, just with less tire wall and more on throttle time. So it's an interesting point. But personally, I don't see him making the final four. Yeah, he's definitely one of the uh, underdogs to make it into the Final Four. And another one you could say, Ryan Blaney. Ryan Blaney is definitely not one of the favorites moving into home, you know, moving into this round. He's not that great at Martinsville. He's all right. He's got that Penske. He could, you know, get help from Keselowski, Logano. Uh, if Texas, I think, is would be his best shot to win. He's been strong up there. I know he was pretty fast there. I think it was the last year in the spring race, and he had like a pit uh, the pit crew cost him. So Ryan Blaney could win at Texas. I think, yeah, like, like you said with Chase Elliott, I think Ryan Blaney's definitely in a must-win situation. If he wants to get into the championship four, he's, I think he sits 21 points out right now as it stands alone. So... Yeah, I think he's going to have to win if he wants any shot. 
I agree. I, Martinsville is going to be an interesting one. He was pretty good there in the spring, and he had a really good race there in the fall of 2017. So it's just really going to see what kind of Ryan Blaney we got this weekend. Um, Texas, I think he can win. He's been very, very good at Texas. That possibly could be his best racetrack. And uh, even Phoenix in the spring, I remember, I know he didn't get the win, but he was up there at the end. I'm not quite sure if it was with strategy, but you never know. But I, I agree. He's going to have to win. You just you can't make up that many points on these guys. They're too good. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, you're not like I'm not even talking about the Gibbs guys. Like I'm talking about like Kevin Harvick and of the other guys who are below with him. You know, he's not only does he have to try to outpoint like the Gibbs guys, he's going to outpoint Harvick, Chase Elliott, these other guys who are going to, you know, be very solid at Martinsville and these other tracks. Obviously, Harvick's very good at Texas as well. Yeah. And. When he's we'll move, yeah, we'll move to Kevin Harvick. Harvick, definitely, you got to look at him as a strong favorite going into the round of eight. He's good at Martinsville. He's like sneaky good at Martinsville. He kind of just he's there up. He's he's toward the back end of the top ten all day, but he seems to know when to charge up to the front towards the end. He may he may not be battling for the win, but he'll definitely be in that top five area. You can expect that from Kevin Harvick. Texas, he can win. He last year he just put a clinic on the field, and you know ISM. I mean Kevin Harvick ISM. I mean there's not too many better combos, you know, driver track in in a sport. So Harvick, I think it's going to be hard to keep Kevin Harvick out of the championship four. Yeah, Har- you mentioned the word sneaky. Honestly, I think he's one of the sneaky guys. He's one of the guys. Obviously, he's a big driver, but I think a few people have kind of forgot about him. You know, he's he had the wins late in the season. Um, he's gotten better, obviously. The team has definitely, at least that team has kind of improved. Stuart Haas as a whole has been off this year. But Kevin Harvick's always been the best car there. And it's it's so hard to count him out. He's mentioned ISM. I almost forget how good he's been there uh, since he hasn't won in a few years. But, I mean, he's always a threat to win there. I know he had some splitter damage in the race last year. And he was still really, really, really fast. And, um... Texas, absolutely. You know, it's going to be interesting this year. You know, obviously they can't get away with what they got away with last year and how much of a difference that will make. I don't know. Martinsville, I see him being consistent. I see him racking up some stage points. And um, it's going to be interesting, though. I think even a guy like Kevin Harvick might have to win in the situation he's in just with how strong the top guys are. Yeah, if we have three different winners, that's at least one point spot. So, you know, he sits, I believe, fourth in the points. No, he sits fifth. He's actually behind Logano. Yep. So, you know, yeah, he might have to win as well. And, you know, we, we'll move on to, we already talked about Logano. We'll move to, uh, we already talked about Denny Hamlin in third. We'll go to Truex. Martin Truex Jr. in second. I think he's been kind of quiet lately. Martin Truex Jr., he's not been putting up, you know, the wins, you know, you know in the second round. He's kind of like, you know, he did put up the wins in the first round. But, you know, in the second round, he really didn't, you know, make all too much noise. He didn't need to. He quietly got himself into the round of eight. And, you know, Martinsville, he's really gotten good there, you know, the last few years. You know, he finally had, he finally broke out, got his first short track win this year. Everyone kept making a big deal over that, you know, Especially him being Rick almost Allen. in short tracks. Yeah, yeah no, Rick. I agree. I think Truex is a guy who's... He, he, I thought he was the championship favorite, honestly, after the first round. It's just his car was so, so good at Richmond. I know Richmond has nothing to do with Homestead, Miami, but he was in a class of his own. Um, you know, he's two, three tenths better than his teammates there. Um, Vegas, obviously another track that you could relate to Homestead, Miami being a mile and a half. Very solid there. Didn't really get a chance to see what um, some of the other guys could do at Vegas. Obviously, Kyle Busch had to come from the back, work his the whole race to get to the front, obviously, to run to a lap car parked in turn one and two. But with Truex, it's just, he's a guy who can make it there, obviously, and he's a guy who can make it on points. He's got that advantage. It's just, Kansas surprised me a little bit. I expected Truex to go there and possibly win his seventh race of the season, and he was probably the third best Gibbs car, maybe the fourth. If Jones was good, he just had a little bad luck, like usual. Um, so mm-hmm. this is interesting. They've been a little off recently. Like you said, that round was definitely not their best. Dover is very impressive, but again, Dover's not a track that I really 
compared to Homestead, it's the same shape, but obviously different size and all that stuff. It's, I don't know. Trix is a guy I'm not quite sure about right now. I think he's going to be up there, but like, I don't know if I can put him as the favorite right now. Yeah, he's got, you know, Martinsville he's good at. Um, Texas, he's he's been all right at. He's, it's not his best mile and a half. And you look at ISM, he hasn't needed to really do much at ISM. So I'm not too sure if he'll be, like, you know, in danger of being eliminated by then or if he'll get a win before that. It'll be interesting to see. We've never really, you know, the last few years, we haven't seen Martin Truex in a high-pressure situation. Yes, so, true. so it'll be interesting to see. And then, you know, the points leader right now, Kyle Busch, he, you know, people are in, you know, people are concerned about Kyle Busch right now. He's not as fast as he was. He doesn't even seem to be, he has not been the fastest Gibbs car the last few, you know, the, throughout the playoffs, really. He's been kind of quiet through the playoffs as well. You know, it'll be interesting to see what he brings in Martinsville. You know, Martin, he's, he's one of those top five drivers at Martinsville. You know, he's a threat to win. Texas, you know, he's a threat to win there. You know, Kyle Busch, that guy, he's really, there's not a track he's really bad at. So, I mean, you can't really discount Kyle Busch anywhere. He can win ISM as well. So, I, I just think the team needs to wake up a little bit. I feel like they're just, like, kind of there. I don't think they're, they don't have the energy right now. Yeah, they have been surprisingly off the ball, boy, for the last it's even been before the playoffs. I mean, it's hard. It's been, you know, it's surprising. He hasn't won since June. I don't think a lot of people would uh, have expected that. You know, he was had a lot of fast cars throughout the summer. Didn't quite take advantage of that. I think Watkins Glen was disappointing. Probably had a car that could compete with Chase Elliott. We never got to see it. Um, Brickyard uh, never really got, you know, never really got to see it. Well, he blew up too. And uh, just a lot of the tracks, Bristol, you know, he was up there, but he wasn't quite, you know, Kyle Busch Bristol. So they've been, they've definitely been off. Uh, you know, it's hard to tell. That's why Las Vegas, for me personally, was disappointing because I wanted to see what he could do starting up front, you know, with the track position, with the, with the good air, what, you know, racing those other guys instead of having to come from the back and being stuck two laps down the entire race. So he's a guy who I think probably could have a few more wins at this point, but the team has just been off. They haven't put races together, and they've been a little sloppy and embarrassing, to be honest with you. You know, Kyle Busch knows they can do better, and you can see it. He's angry. You know, he wants to win again. He's a guy who expects to win lots of races. He knows he's got team, usually, to get the job done. And I think this is a round where he's either going to do what he did in 2015 and just sort of lay back and let other people spotlight and he'll sneak his way in or he'll go out there and make a statement you know i think he he's really a guy who wants to win you could see that kansas he he wanted to win that race so bad and use you know a few different things go you know other ways you never know what we're talking about this weekend but i just don't know what to think with that team right now they're just it's either they're like they're holding something back or maybe they just don't have it maybe they're just a little off it's hard to say yeah it's interesting you know, who would have thought after last year that it seems like Denny Hamlin is the best car at Gibbs right now. It seems like he's, his whole team, he's just got that swagger right now. I mean, he's just got that confidence that I, I feel like the 19 and the 18 just don't have right now going into this round. Well, it's interesting because Truex has got six wins. And I think, you know, he could, he probably could have more this year. He's been very strong uh, throughout the regular season obviously in the first round too. And then Kyle Busch, I mean, I think some people were thinking he might win 10 races early in the year when he won three early on, all that. I mean, and but Denny's just been the most consistent throughout the entire year. You know, Truex has been high and low. Kyle started very, very strong, and now he's dipped throughout the year. But Denny's been consistent. He's been consistent the entire year. He's taken advantage of other people's mistakes, and he's just always getting the most out of that race car. They're, they have not been off that much this year. If all any, yeah, seventeen top fives, twenty one top tens. It's it's really you know, you know he's finishing in the top five more than half the races this season, and compared to that's two more than Kyle Busch, the four more than Martin Truex. I mean, it's just and these guys lead the stats in basically everything. It's it's insane, and. You know, the, those those three, I, I expect those three to all make it to the Final Four. 
along with Kevin Harvick. I don't know what, what what's who's your uh, final four. Boy, it's hard to say. I I definitely see at least two Gibbs cars making it. The only thing that's going to stop three from making it, I think, is if some of these guys like Harvick or uh, Chase Elliott get wins. Obviously, if Harvick and Elliott, let's say Elliott wins the Martinsville, Harvick wins Texas. You can't, you know, you can't have five guys in the final four. That the math doesn't. Yeah. Work. You can only get two of them in. The question is, who makes it? Um, they're very close in points. Obviously, Denny got a bit of a gain with that win at Kansas. I think that was big. People don't realize, you know, they got six extra playoff points from that race. Uh, and that's big. That 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 could be the difference. Mm-hmm. My final four is tough. I've got to put two Gibbs guys. I'm gonna say my final four. I'm going to say Chase Elliott, uh, Martin Truex Jr., Denny Hamlin, and Kevin Harvick. Interesting. Seeing the 18 not make it. Are they just they've been off, and I just I. I don't have that feeling that I've, you know, had with that team in the past. They just, they're good, but they just seem like they're one of those, those teams that throw away, throw away a good car. You know, like sometimes it's been Kyle's mistake or sometimes it's just been dumb luck. And it's just one of those painful years. It's sort of like Harvick in, uh, I guess I'll use Harvick in 2015, even 2014, obviously won the championship that year. But he was a guy who had so many, race winning cars and didn't take advantage of it and this year kyle bush has had a lot of race winning cars and you can see that's why he's angry because he hasn't taken advantage of that and now that he's a little off it's even you know it's sort of compounded itself even more so i can see out of the gibbs guys he's been the least consistent of the playoffs so there's gonna be a gibbs guy who doesn't make it because other guys win i I gotta go with the 18 i just i think truex and denny are more consistent right now even though kyle's got the and you know from one championship battle to another you know this, we're going virtual the nascar he for esports pro championship uh finale at ism took place i believe it was last night and what a finish we saw yeah the pencil car using lessons learned from legato <laughs> no, i'm just kidding <laughs> That was, uh, I'm sorry to say, but it's, uh, I, I really don't know what to think about that. You know, it's obviously, it's pretty entertaining, but I think <laughs> at the same time, it's got to be a little embarrassing. I mean, uh, yeah, just, to, you know, these guys are, it's, it's, a, it's a pro league. It's called a pro league. You don't expect a guy to dive bomb on the apron three wide on the last lap in a pro league. And, uh, <laughs> you know, obviously... Been all, all been critical of NASCAR heat. It's gotten better over the years. It's still not perfect. It's a long way from being perfect or a credible mm-hmm. racing game, in my opinion. And um, it, it, I don't know what to think of that. I think it was just a little sad. I mean, obviously, it's exciting. And it's, you just saw the reaction, though. I mean, reading the YouTube comments or the Twitter comments or whatever it was, there were not many people um, <laughs> saying good things about that. <laughs> thing, so. Yeah, I think honestly, I think it was a good idea. I think it's you know it helps you know promote more towards esports because that's kind of the way this industry is moving. They're you know adding esports to a lot of games. You know, you've got those Madden championships, the uh, NBA 2K championships. I think it was a good idea by NASCAR, but just some of these, the way they formatted it was kind of weird. They would just kind of take race time, total race times through custom setups and stuff and you know it doesn't even judge if these guys are good or not i mean and we saw there i mean you got guys go doing that i mean it looks like we you know you're in a public lobby with these guys and they're just yeah flying in there to win i mean it's just that's one of my big big problems with this game is that it's really about if you know something that other people don't there's not enough parity in the race cars and the way they drive and um you, you know, being a half tenth better in NASCAR Heat Four is big because everybody runs the exact same lap times every lap uh, for the mm-hmm. most majority of the time. And um, you know, except for, if you're Ryan Marin, but for the majority, you know, <laughs> you're very equal. And it's, I just personally, like, I think it's great. I agree with you. I think it's great 
to have something to promote this stuff. Obviously, you know, video games are huge now. This generation is kind of taking over that, which is really cool to see. But at the same time, it, it, look at the difference between the products. You've got Madden. I mean, Madden's notorious. Everyone plays Madden. This had its ups and downs, but, you know, it's very well known. It's a huge game. I mean, it's one of the biggest sporting games in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, NBA, obviously, a lot of people play that. But then you have NASCAR Heat 4 that's made in the program Unity, which is what university students make to make little comp sci projects with. You know, it's <laughs> no offense to Unity, but it's not really something I would expect a professional Xbox One sport racing game to be made with. I mean, you look at uh, F1. I mean, obviously, there's way more money being put into that game. But a company like Codemasters, can you imagine? Can you imagine? If a company like Codemasters made a NASCAR game, we would all never get off the thing. We would never, we would never stop racing. I, I can't even imagine how good it would be. Codemasters is flawless. I mean, they've made some amazing games. I think it, way back in 2003, they made the last IndyCar racing game, and that game was fantastic. Uh, I just think right now the product, just the video game itself, is a little embarrassing for the sport. And uh, honestly, I think you've got to have a better video game product you've got to have something that's a little more comparable to the other franchises before you could really start making because i think it's a little embarrassing in my opinion i like the idea i love the publicity and all the esports thing but you've got to fix the product you've got to fix you've got to make i don't know yeah, if you get you know if you get proper handling physics i mean i don't think people are allowed can even do that and you you just don't see this separation. Like you said, I think everyone's just too close. It's too even. It's just, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty rough. And I think, you know, the, the idea, like we've said, the idea is good. I think they just need a better game to support the idea. That's really what will put it all together. And, you know, like it's cool to have someone, you know, they, you know, they get them out to Charlotte to, you know, race that championship race and, you know, feel like they're a part of a team you know that's pretty yeah. cool like I, I do like that you know i heard the winner got a few thousand dollars in prizes i think that's pretty cool and you know they worked on setups as teams you know it's 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 really cool they just need a better game hopefully that comes here in the near yeah. future and you know something else that was crazy that happened this weekend brandon jones winning that that, that was bizarre that is something I don't think. Uh, if you bet Brandon Jones to win this week, you probably won a lot of money, but you probably also a lot of loss of it before if you picked them before. <laughs> it's uh, boy Brandon Jones. I, I'm happy for the guy. I mean, honestly, like you know, I'm not, I'm not going out on a limb when I say this. He's not the most talented guy in the Xfinity series, and I mean, he's it's it's fair to say he's underperformed in Gibbs equipment. I don't. I mean, I think Christopher Bell's making him look a little worse. But mm-hmm. um, he just he doesn't seem to have it, in my opinion. I mean, he's a he's a okay driver, but he's you know he's too inconsistent. He's obviously got the crashes. I mean, he spun out on a straightaway last year at Kansas in the playoffs. Yep. And uh, I was happy for him. I was I was happy for him. I think it's cool to, for him to have a win. Um, but even then, I mean, it's just uh, he doesn't seem like a guy you can push it like the other guys. You saw it those last few laps of the race. He was very conservative, running that inside line, even though it was slower. And those guys almost caught him at the end of the race. Yeah. So it's uh, a big, big win for Brandon Jones, but I really don't know if it changes much, in my opinion. I, I think he's still just the Brandon Jones that everybody else has known. It's not, it's not like he went out there and dominated the race. And, you know, put a clinic on, you know, he was in a good spot and uh, the leaders took each other out. And Jeff Burton reacted very interestingly to that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, Brand Jones took advantage. I mean, sometimes you got to be lucky and more lucky than good. And uh, this week it finally fell in his hands. Yeah, if you haven't already, go to <laughs> YouTube and just YouTube the Christopher Bell and Chase Briscoe wreck. And just listen to Jeff Burton. They're all screaming, you know, whoa. And then Jeff Burton makes this noise. We can't, we, we, there's no way to decipher if he's trying to say a word, but he definitely makes a noise. Definitely check that one out if you want a good laugh. Yeah. You know, maybe one day, you know, in a few years, I'll talk to Jeff Burton. 
we'll see. I'll I'll bring that up to him. See what he was uh, thinking during that wreck. Yeah. But you know, the guy that almost <laughs> passed, you know the guy that almost passed Chris or not Christopher Bell, uh, Brandon Jones there at the end was Tyler Reddick. Uh, him and Cole Custer got into an interesting altercation after the race. It was definitely in response to the way Reddick raced Cole Custer on the uh, one of the last restarts. Kind of sent him up the track. That's how Brandon Jones got the lead. And I, you know, Custer went over to talk to him, and he put his you know arm on his shoulder, and Reddick basically just took that as you know he wanted to fight, and basically they just kind of pushed each other to the ground. And, you know, I know you're a big advocate of just letting the drivers go at it. And the pit crews need to stay out of it. So I'm going to let you talk on this. Yeah, it's, I mean, interesting is an interesting word. And it was an interesting fight, that's for sure. Tyler Reddick's an aggressive driver. He has gained more confidence, in my opinion, than anybody else in the Xfinity Series. Personally, I didn't think he was that good. Um, last year, I thought, was a disappointing season. And I thought the championship was a bit of a joke. Uh, obviously, he was very good at Homestead, and he won that race. He deserved to win that race for sure, but it was just—it was hard to view him as a champion. He won one plate race, and then he won the final race, and that was it. So it was like, yeah, whatever. But this year, he's backed it up. He's proved me wrong. He—he he said this. I think it was on the Dale Jr. download. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was on NASCAR America. But he said he learned so much from the junior motorsports cars of the feeling he wanted in that car. And when he got to RCR, he said he was able to put that feeling perfectly into the setup so i think he's just been wreaking confidence because he knows he can put the car in a certain spot or push it this way and it's going to do what he wants him to do and that's dangerous whenever any driver has that in racing um and he's aggressive like you said i mean him and cole custer you know it's that was hard racing i mean you know he slid up a little bit but it wasn't the end of the world it's not like he dumped cole custer or anything and I don't think Cole Custer wanted to fight him, but I do think he was pissed. I mean, he, you know, he called him um, a dumb, you know what, mm-hmm. as he put his arms on him, which usually isn't very inviting. Usually, you know, with most civilized people, I feel like you can put your arm on them without them reacting. But we, you know, this is America. People have, sh- you know, those guys have some short tempers, and some people take that as an offensive thing. I don't think he wanted to fight him. I think he just wanted to tell him he was a dumb, you know what, mm-hmm. and. um I think Reddick was just uh, obviously emotional, getting ready. He just wanted to um, – maybe, maybe if Custer hadn't put his arm on him, that doesn't happen. But I think Reddick just maybe took it the wrong way. I, I really don't know. I don't think Custer wanted to fight. And uh, props to the uh, – sarcastically, props to the crew member of Cole Custer's team who had to go in there and almost rip Tyler Reddick's head off. Um, personally, I don't like that. You know, I want to see the two guys go at it. I know the crew members are all there. It's a human reaction to get involved. But when Cole Custer and Tyler Reddick go down to the ground and Tyler Reddick comes up fighting somebody else, it's like, ugh, you know, it's a little annoying. I want to see these guys man it out. I want to see them, you know, just deal with their own business. You know, obviously I don't want to see violence every week in the sport. You know, it's, you know, it's a rare occurrence, obviously. So I don't think we have to worry about that. But when it happens, you know, I, I want to see, I want to see them them deal with it. It's obviously it's different in NASCAR with all those guys around, but maybe there's something they can do by finding pit crew members who get involved in things like that interactions. You know, but I think that's ruined a mm-hmm. lot of possible interesting interactions over the years between drivers, and uh, that's just one of the me- members I see. I mean, maybe find the drivers too, but I mean, you don't want to completely just promote pure emotion and anger and all that stuff because I mean, as Kevin Harvick has said, the sport was built on fights. It's, uh, I don't know, I'd like to see something done by NASCAR to not promote the other crew guys from getting it. Once one guy goes down or whatever, whatever it is, you know, if the, they could call it whatever, but just go get in there immediately. You know, they literally touched each other for two seconds and all of a sudden these guys were all swarming them and guys who had absolutely nothing to do with it, but they just wanted to be involved and defend their driver, which to be fair to them is fair, but I wish there was some kind of way NASCAR could like, find crew members or give some kind of incentive for not getting involved in two drivers having a disagreement. Yeah, and I think it's I think it just came it comes a more of a mess with the crew members. I think more people, you know, are at risk of getting hurt with all these people, you know, in Good just point. piles. And, you know, these drivers at the start of it are usually the ones that end up at the bottom, which is the most dangerous. 
So if anything, you're just putting your driver more at harm by trying to just crowd in there. That's a very, very good point. I mean, I think I'll use Major League Baseball as an example. One of my least favorite parts about Major League Baseball is when there's a fight, the pitchers from the bullpen run out. Mm-hmm. I, have never, I have never once in my life seen a fight where more people getting involved helps it. The yeah. more people you add, like, that's a great point, Dom. I didn't even think about that. The more people you add, the worse it gets. You know, people get trampled on, all that stuff. I don't understand the whole everybody needs to run out to go, oh, is everybody good? Is everybody good? You only need one, you know, a few people to do that. You don't need, I wish, and personally, this is off topic, I wish in baseball they, you know, ban people running out from the bullpen. I think if you're not on the field, you shouldn't be able to go on it during a fight. Mm-hmm. Um, but in, it's, it's the same in NASCAR. I mean, you that's a great point. People can get hurt from this. Like, it brings me back to the 2014 Texas race. You know that one very well, Jeff Gordon versus Brad Kulowski. Yeah. I mean, that was them going at it and Harvick with the famous push. But all of a sudden, it was just a flat-out brawl. It was crew members going at it. It was all these guys who were, you know, didn't have anything to do with what the drivers did. And all of a sudden, it's a completely different fight. It's 30 people involved. And poor, poor Paul Menard's crew is just standing there like we didn't do anything. It's, uh, I think that's just... It's it's the danger factor. The danger factor. It's huge. Yeah, and it's just it's annoying. It really sucks. It's we need fights. I agree, but we just don't need those types. It's just it's like for all we knew, you know, in 2012 at Phoenix, Jeff Gordon could have been in the bio, bottom of that pile. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Alan Bestwick thought he was for a while until they uh, realized he wasn't. But it's it's so possible. It's such a it's such a strong possibility of these fights. Um, people get involved so quickly. I think of Kenseth and Kozlowski, I mean, behind the hall, or, you know, Kenseth got one little chance to swing at him, didn't really get him, and then before he knew it, it was, uh, you know, Bob asked Paul Wolf was in there breaking it up and all those guys. And um, I mean, I get, I get it. It's human nature. You got to stand up for your dudes, all that stuff. As a fan, you you know, you want to see, you want to see one, you know, you want to see mono e mono. You don't, you want to see you want the two pinnacle, the two variables that we're focused on. I don't give a dang about the pit crew members. I'm sorry. I re- I don't know who many other names are, to be honest. That's not why I watch the sport, is to see the pit crew members get into fights. I want, I want to see the drivers show their passing and go at it. Yeah. And, you know, I think it was actually interesting. How ESPN managed to capture that Brad Kozlowski, Matt Kenseth thing. You That's know, it's dark job. in between the hauls. Yeah, absolutely just... unbelievable. I, I miss ESPN. I think ESPN was underappreciated. They really made NASCAR look magical on TV. I just think of the most epic races I've watched. A lot of them were from ESPN days with Alan Bestwood calling them. And just unbelievable camera work. That's probably one of the best fights captured on video, even though it wasn't the biggest fight. Yeah, and it's... It's definitely one, you know, it's a great camera angle. It's just a great prediction. And, you know, just I feel like the fights now are just kind of more unexpected now. I feel like like no one expected Custer and Reddick to go at it. And I feel like a lot of these become more unpredictable. I think the last predictable one was kind of the Kyle Wish one with Logano. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, Logano just straight up took him out. It's kind of, it was kind of, you know, vindictive, you know, you know, last time I thought there might have been one could have been Truex and Logano, but I can't see, I've never seen Martin Truex really get into a fight. Yeah, Truex is an interesting guy. I mean, I feel bad for him. I think he gets too much crap from the, the fans for not fighting. But at the same time, I respect that. I think, you know, he's allowed to get angry and not fight. You know, just because he gets mad at somebody doesn't mean he has to fight them necessarily. He's just a guy who wants to do things the right way. He doesn't want to be angry. He doesn't want to have to fight. He doesn't want to have to, you know, say the angry things he said after Martinsville, whatever it was. You know, he's a guy who expects to be raced clean because he races clean and he didn't get that. And that angers him. And I, I think it's disappointing that a lot of fans have turned on him. Uh, because he doesn't fight. I, I'll personally, I respect that. I think he's mature enough not to, you know, just go down there and be short-tempered. You know, fighting is only for a few guys, you know. Fighting doesn't always make you look like a, a good dude. Sometimes it makes you look silly because you don't know how to um, answer things and, you know, converse things and figure things out with your words. I think that really shows a mature person. 
to you know people who can figure things out with their words obviously fighting is a lot more entertaining but for Truex he's as Dale Jr. said you know he talks like drives like Mark Martin talks like Earnhardt you know it's fair it's fair but I mean Truex is a guy he he races clean you know he races clean he expects Mm -hmm. he had every chance to drift up to into Logano last year at Homestead and uh you get payback for Martinsville and Personally, I wouldn't have minded it. I think, you know, I think a lot of people thought Turex was going to go for some kind of payback, and he didn't. You know, he just, he races clean, and even when people take him out, he doesn't go back at them. He wants to set the example that he's the good guy, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, yeah, I can't believe there's guys that out there that get mad at him for, like, complaining. That yeah, I don't understand that. I mean, drivers have complained since the day one of NASCAR. I don't understand why that's a new thing all of a sudden. Um, I, I think it has something to do with Truex being more relevant now. You know, when Truex, people say Truex has changed and become more ungrateful and stuff. He's the same guy he was ten years ago. He's just more relevant. You know, he's he's in a better team. So obviously, you're going to see more of his personality. He was the same dude ten years ago. He just wasn't in the positions he's in now. That's the difference. He hasn't changed. It's just the position he is. He's in his change. He's the same person. He just wasn't in these high pressure situations earlier in his career and all this stuff. I think he's a good dude. And um, I, th- I think it's disappointing to see a lot of the fan base turn on him. I don't know what it has to do with him just being more relevant. I mean, I think that's a big thing of it. Maybe driving for Gibbs, you know, Gibbs seems to be a team that people love to hate. I don't know whether it's jealousy of Toyota being the most American car in the field or what it is. Um, them just having incredible drivers, you know, being able to beat Chevy and Ford mostly on a week. I mean, they're basically already locked up the manufacturer's championship this year. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure what it is. You know, NASCAR is a sport more than any where you have to, have to, have to take in the bias factor you know there's 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 a lot of bias there's you know no offense to the chase elliott fans listening but chase elliott fans have more of an influence on the sport than anybody it was like dale jr fans back in the day and i'm going to use them as an example so like for denny hamlin you know obviously got into chase elliott two years ago at martinsville a lot of other guys that that happened you know it's like hey it's you know he wrecked them you know stuff happens but it's because it's chase elliott denny hamlin has this grudge held against him you know people are chanting bleep denny hamlin as home track i mean i think that was a little disappointing to mm-hmm. see fans turn so quickly but it's all the bias you know if if 50 percent of the nascar fans are chase elliott fans they are going to have a strong 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 opinion and it's just you see that more in this sport than any other i think the bias of fan base is really depicting how drivers are looked at. I think Bubba Wallace is another example. A lot of people like Bubba Wallace. I'm not sure if it's a, a sympathy thing. I don't want to say sympathy because he's a good driver, but, you know, people obviously want him to do well and they feel bad that he's, you know, had struggles and all that stuff. But he seems to be one of those guys that sort of gets a little extra bias or prep with him. I'm not too sure why, but there's those guys in the sport and that, those fans have the strongest influence. And Truex is not the most popular driver. He's got fans. He's got a decent following, but he doesn't have enough of a following to really speak up and sort of balance out that bias. Yeah, no, definitely. It's uh, it's interesting. Like you said, you know, he used to see him about 10 years ago. I think in 2010 at Sonoma, Jeff Gordon got into him. And then Truex ended up getting into a wreck because of it on the next restart. And he said, Jeff, better watch out. He's got it coming to him. And he never did anything to him. Yeah. So, you know, he, like you said, you know, he drives like Mark Martin and, you know, talks like Dale Earnhardt. It's just, you know, it's but how it is. I think a lot of that is the heat of the moment. You know, we've seen it from Ricky, uh, Ricky Stenhouse, excuse me, uh, a lot this year. He's, he, I mean, I think everybody in the field has had one coming from Ricky Stenhouse, according to him. But yet he hasn't done anything. I think that's a heat of the moment thing. You know, Mark uh, Truex is a guy, you know, once he cools down, he says, you know, oh, I'm not going to go and wreck them. I'm going to be the bigger guy. But in the heat of the moment, he says those things. Who doesn't? Yeah. And, you know, one thing I'd like to see, uh, it was brought up yesterday on NASCAR Race Hub, uh, Jeff Gordon and Denny Hamlin potentially, you know, maybe doing the, 
a small, you know, 1v1, you know, at Martinsville. I think that'd be pretty cool if they did it, like, you know, maybe during the weekend next year in the spring, you know, their first night race, you know, maybe just throw that in somewhere. I think that'd be a pretty cool event, you know, two of the best drivers at Martinsville. I mean, both their stats are incredible. If you want to read more on that, you can uh, read my article I put today on Belly Up Sports about Jeff Gordon versus Denny Hamlin. But it would be interesting to see. I'm wondering, what, would you want to see that something like that happen? I like it. I just hope, uh, you know, one doesn't stake it up and dump the other guy on the first lap and automatically win it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why. I don't. I think they've got, a, you know. I think they've got enough respect for each other that they wouldn't, but it'd be, it'd be a little anticlimactic if Jeff's like, oh, I don't want to lose. <laughs> or Denny's like, yeah, screw this. <laughs> but, uh, that'd be interesting. I mean, you know, what kind of cars do they use? You know, do they use like IROC cars or like even completely even cars or what is it separate teams or, you know, what exactly kind of format? I mean, obviously they said a hundred laps, but all the other things, all the other variables, I think it'd be cool. I think NASCAR needs more of those things. I think they need more kind of, off little invitational events or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, they only have the All Star Race and the uh, the yeah. Clash right now. So yeah, yeah. They definitely need some more. I, like they used to do the Prelude to the Dream, that was awesome. You know, they kind of stopped doing that. And yeah, something like that. Even if they like threw in like the best drivers, like Jimmy Johnson, even in there, like just a nice like heat race or something with like the top guys from Martinsville. You know, in recent memory, you can like throw Tony, you could throw Tony Stewart in a car. You know, it'd be pretty cool to see. And, you know, Martinsville this week, I think it's going to be a good race. Hopefully, we don't see, you know, the package, you know, interfere too much this week, you know, and hinder passing. I think. He usually does. I feel like it's going to come down to some short runs at the end, which could benefit the Penske guys because I feel like the Gibbs guys are going to be set up for the long run like they usually are. They always take care of their tires over the long runs. They're just that experienced and that good here. I, I think it's hard to it's hard to predict a long run ending this race. I think it's gonna that's what's going to allow the Penske guys in this to try to win. Yeah, it's really interesting to look back at the last few years, obviously 2017 was uh, pretty crazy at the end of the race, to say the least. 2018 last year came down to, I think it was like a 30-lap run maybe. Um, and then um, 2016 was a very long run. That was a bit of an outlier uh, with Jimmy mm-hmm. Johnson. I, I really don't think Jimmy Johnson wins that race if you have a bunch of shootouts at the end of it. Um, so it really just depends. I mean, it, sometimes it's luck. Sometimes it's uh, just the way things go. But this is one of those races. We always talk about racing. You know, it's obviously the end is the most important part, blah, blah, blah. But Martinsville, those last 50 laps, depending if a caution comes out or not, is going to completely, in my opinion, depict who wins the race. Because there's going to be people with short-run cars. There's going to be people with long-run cars. And there's going to be people with mid-run cars. And the way the cautions fall obviously affects things so much. But at Martinsville, I think, more than any other track in this round. And like you said, qualifying could be big. Qualifying is going to be huge. You know, there's only real, there's realistically only two good pit stalls at this track. That's that's how it lies. I mean, you, you know, you've got your clear exits and, and entrances, but they're really short. They're nothing like you got a huge advantage. So it's almost key to get. You know, the pole is going to be so. It means so much. You almost guaranteed to gain two to three spots of pit stop. That's just how good that pit stall is. Such a clean exit. You don't have to worry about the chaos entering, you know, getting out of your pit. It's just that's the one problem with the, you know, the first pit stall is uh, if you do pit from the front, by the time your pit your pit stops done, you still got guys in the back coming in. Yeah. So Good. that's it's qualifying is going to be huge, probably the most important qualifying session, like you said. And so we get to Homestead. I. It's going to be an interesting race as long as these playoff drivers can keep their noses clean for the first, you know, 400, 450 laps. It's going to be, I think, chaos at the end. I think we're going to have a good battle for the win, you know, especially if we get like a Chase Elliott or, a, you know, a Ryan Blaney, Kyle Larson up front knowing that they need to win. That's where it's going to get pretty interesting. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be a really good race. I look at the drivers in this round. A lot of them are good at Martinsville. Obviously, We'll talk about this later, but I think one of the outliers has to be Kyle Larson. He struggled there in the past. Um, 
And he's one of those guys, I don't want to predict the future, but he's one of those guys I can see getting his bumper knocked in earlier or something, maybe even a radiator knocked out if he's not careful. I, I mm-hmm. know he takes a lot of contact to knock out a radiator in Martinsville, but it can happen. And, you know, we talk about aerodynamics. They're probably the most important they've ever been at Martinsville with this package. They're not huge, but they still make a change. And we did see in the spring the passing was just a little, little more difficult. It's still Martinsville. It's still going to be good racing. It's still going to be... Hopefully we see some multi-groove. Um, but Arrow's going to be important. I mean, Arrow's important at every track, but Martinsville more than ever with this package. I know we use the package word all the time, but it's 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 very valid. It's very it's a sound argument to use the package argument because it's so different. It's Every race has been different this year with this package. And you get caught up in the midfield. You get your bumper torn off or you, your nose caved in early in the race it can ruin your whole race so we talked about qualifying but larson's one of those guys if he can qualify well maybe he can stay out of that i mean i don't see him having long run speed he's never had long run speed at martinsville but it can happen to any of these guys they've got to be smart the first 450 laps like you said wait till the end just take care of it it's such a finesse track it's a, that's why gordon all those guys were so good at it. Gordon was so good at being finesse, so good at being smooth. Why Denny Hamlin's there? They take care of their stuff. They don't show off the first 300 laps of the race. They just run the way they want to. And that's going to be key. Yeah, and, you know, you look at it, I think it's, you know, like you said, the package is going to make a big difference. And, you know, if we're, you know, the, the drivers to steer clear from this week, the playoff drivers. I think the two you've got to look at, Kyle Larson, we've already talked about him, and Ryan Blaney. I think Ryan Blaney's that he's kind of a wild card. I think he can run up front. I think if he takes, you know, some advice and some setups from his Penske guys, he could be up front at the beginning of runs and potentially qualify up front. And you know, he could with that maybe fall back a little more than the Penske guys usually do which could set him behind the eight ball. I don't expect these guys to win. I think it'd be a shocker if one of these two were to win. I, that's just how it goes with Martinsville. I, I wouldn't take a look at them to be contenders to win until Texas. Yeah, I agree. Kyle Larson, for sure. I think he'd shock the world if he went up Martinsville this year. I think it'd be the biggest upset in NASCAR in I mean, a long time. And obviously, we had Justin Haley. But I, th- I think Larson performing at Martinsville like uh, Denny Hamlin or Jeff Gordon would just be an absolute shock to the entire world. We don't know what this package is going to do to impact that. You know, in the spring race, he didn't look all that good. Uh, Blaney looked a lot better in the spring race, for sure. He was solid. He's had good races at Martinsville, like we talked about. But the consistency isn't there. You know, I look at the other six guys in the chase. Truex, he's going to be good in Martinsville. He's been so good at short tracks. I don't know if it's Cole Pern or the Give Short Track program, which we all know is first class. Um, Kyle Busch, he's been he's gone better and better at Martinsville. Finally knocked off some wins. Denny Hamlin, I mean, yeah, how can you not count on Denny Hamlin? You know he's going to be good. Chase Elliott, Kevin Harvick is very solid. And Joey Logano, he's the one guy I'm not sure about. You look at last year, I firmly believe that pit stall, and I don't think I'm going out on a limb on saying this, I firmly believe that pit stall won him the race. He gained, mm-hmm. like you said, he gained multiple spots in that pit stall throughout the race last year. It, it just it kept him up front. Every time he fall back, the pit stop, the cars would come out, he'd get back up front. And so if Logano doesn't get a good pit stall this year, or the, so excuse me, this week, <laughs> the race isn't that long. Um, <laughs> you know, it could be uh, it could be game changing. Really, I I really think well, we keep pressing, you know, beating a dead horse on this, but qualifying is huge this weekend. There's not very, not many very good <laughs> pit stalls at Martinsville, and that first one is so op. I think it's more of an advantage than maybe any other pit stall at any track. And yeah, no. Just, uh, if Logano doesn't get that, he's maybe one of my guys to steer clear of with Kyle Larson. I'm between him and Ryan Blaney for my second steer clear because I think Ryan Blaney's going to have a good weekend. I think he's ready to really show something. He was good here in the spring. And Logano, he's been inconsistent. I think if he falls back, I don't think he'll be able to get back up there, especially not with a good pit stall. Yeah. 
Uh, so who do you got winning this week? Got to pick one. I'm going to go with Brad Kozlowski. Oh, out of the uh, Chase guys or anybody? No, no, just a winner, race winner. I'm going, with, I'm going with Brad Kozlowski. I think he's got something to prove. I think he's angry. And I really, really think that two team missed a good opportunity this year, uh, not making the next round. Because I, I definitely thought Brad Kozlowski, if he made this next round, would be a guy locking his way into Homestead. He has been very, very good at Martinsville. Brad Kozlowski's a super smart racer, you know, most of the time, especially at short tracks. Um, being confident, saving his stuff. He's learned a lot. He's a guy who learns and knows how race cars work. Uh, probably, you know, I, I'd say Kozlowski and Kyle Busch are probably the two guys, in my opinion, who know how to make race cars work the best. They know the parts and pieces of the race car inside and out. And he's so good there. He's so smart. And he's just really been one of the best cars in the last few years. Like, he probably could have won maybe even a few more Martinsville races. So I, I expect Brad Kozlowski to play spoiler this weekend and really shake up the chase. So I'm going to go with Martin Truex Jr. this week. I think Martinsville owes him one. I think the karma, the good karma is going to finally come back to him. I think he's going to win this week, lock himself into Homestead. And finally win the damn war. Yeah, and it's be interesting. I think he'll win. And I think if he races Logano at the end, if it was the same way last year, I think he'll rough him up a little more than he did this uh, last year. So yeah, yeah, and I don't think anyone's gonna bat an eye if that happens. I don't think anyone's gonna be uh, hard on him, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, you see Martin Truex Jr. win. I expect the Gibbs guys to run good. I have to expect. Logano to finish at least in the top 10 Harvick in the top 10 the other guys you know Chase Elliott I think he could get a top five you know it's going to be interesting stage points going to be huge you know and that comes with a good starting spot so all that you know combined together is it's what the formula is to a good start to the round definitely want to try to be somewhere around the cut line if not above it and I think that's you know all you need to do out of Martinsville. I agree. I agree. There's going to be a lot of guys in the top 10 in the playoffs. I would be shocked. Unless there's some big wrecks and uh, problems and adversity, I would be shocked if at least six of the playoff guys don't finish in the top 10. Yeah. So that's all we've got here uh, for you guys today. Going into Martinsville. Uh, unless you have any last second thoughts here, Rob, I just think tune in this week. If you haven't been watching, tune in. Martinsville Fall, the last two race or last two years, excuse me, I'll get that right one of these days, <laughs> has been one of the races to watch of the year. It's yeah. gonna have a lot of hype, a lot of build up from last year, and I just I don't expect it to dis- disappoint. All right, and with that, uh, check out. Belly Up Racing, Belly Ups on Belly Up Sports. This has been the Steer Clear Podcast, Episode 4. I'm Dom Caps with Rob Pretty, and we will see you guys next week for Episode 5.